Oh, hi. Come on in. Wander over to this corner. Do you remember the other day we looked at, at Ross Wilson's wonderful Lewis portrait? Um, I thought it might be nice to have a look at another portrait, which is not unrelated, although um, it, uh, it's by a different uh, artist. This is a really nice print by James Artemis Owen, um, uh, a, a fantasy illustrator and writer and artist. In fact, it's signed by him here, and it says The Inklings, and it's a p depiction of Lewis's rooms, C.S. Lewis's rooms in Magdalen College, Oxford, on those um, Thursday evenings when his friends, who came to be known as The Inklings, called round. And you're sort of looking, I think, at this. That's uh, Charles Williams. I think that's Owen Barfield. Lewis with the, the gown, Tolkien with the pipe. Um, probably Christopher Tolkien, Warney Lewis. Um, uh, perhaps Hugo Dyson arriving there. Um, but if you look closely, you'll see this. Uh, it's just like this side, isn't it? There's lots of books everywhere and books in piles. But if you can just see there, there's an open book with a wonderful dragonish creature in it. And uh, that creature, uh, not written about um, by this Lewis, but by Lewis Carroll, is a Bandersnatch. And... Um, I must tell you about this book, uh, Bandersnatch, uh, just as I have the the uh, um, print signed by the author, so I have this book signed by its author, uh, Diana Glare as well. But just as we go, let me pull another book, let me pull another couple of books off the shelves um, so that uh, we can illustrate things fairly. I'm going to take, uh, the, generally over here is my inkling stuff. I've got Lewis and Tolkien and... Charles Williams and Owen Barfield. I've got a whole bookshelf of that as well in um, college, so I haven't got all of my books here. This is my Arthuriana, because um, I hope one day, if God spares me, to take, uh, have a go at, at what they call the matter of Britain. But I'm going to put, pull another book out of this, because this is very much to do with the Inklings. So let's come and sit down. Um, get yourself a seat, if George will permit us. Zara was here a minute ago, but she seems to have made herself scarce, I think. She's a bit shy. Um, anyway, uh, let me tell you about, about the book that goes. The reason why... I'm going to light up again, if you don't mind. Um, when I'm in a sort of Tolkien-ish Tolkien and uh, Lewis-ish mood, I sometimes get out this very beautiful uh, Dragon's Claw, Meersham Pipe, as it's, it's called. I bought this in Oxford on the proceeds, or partly, uh, with a little bit of what I was given for doing some some talks on talking. So having seen a, a pipe that actually called itself Dragon's Claw, I thought, well, what better way to spend some money? Now, um, so the Inklings were this informal group that met around Lewis. And um, for uh, most of us who came to hear about them and know a little bit more and discovered that two of our favourite authors, let's say C.S. Lewis and and talking actually knew each other, were delighted to do that. The book that got us going, many of us on this, was a, a book by Humphrey Carpenter called The Inklings. C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, Charles Williams and their friends. Which is a very fine book in its own way. And it has a fabulous chapter in it called Thursday Nights, which reconstructs an evening just such as James Artemis in there illustrates. But in the end, Carpenter, perhaps a little wistfully and regretfully, concludes that they weren't really a movement, that they weren't really a collaborative group, that they just all happened to be friends of C.S. Lewis, and the only thing that held them together was the happenstance of knowing Lewis. And I felt, even on the evidence of this as I read it, that that couldn't quite be the case. I felt a commonality of vision and a sense of connectedness between these writers that went rather deeper than he suggests. So I was thrilled when a... American scholar uh, Diana Glyer wrote an absolutely superb book called The Company They Keep, which is a very scholarly book going through all the sources and all the letters between them and the evidence of comments and criticisms between them and showed um, that they really did work together and made a case for a kind of careful and immensely fruitful collaboration, however disparate the authors within that group might have been. Anyway, it's a great book. I once had the pleasure, just after she'd written that, we were both teaching at the Kilns at um, 
C.S. Lewis's old home in Oxford and I sat, not in this study or even in that study in Magdalen, but in Lewis's own study in the kilns, in two armchairs, just like we're sitting now, and had, uh, had wonderful conversations with her. But a while back, she produced, I think very handily, a kind of popular version of the scholarly book, aimed not at the academic, but at the aspiring writer or at little writers' groups, and just retold the story of this great collaboration between these writers in Oxford and made it kind of available to people. I'm going to put the, the dragon's claw down there and concentrate on other things. And um, it's a remarkable book. Uh, let me let me just give you a quick um, a quick sample from it. Um, uh, so uh, she, one of the things she sort of says that people can do for each other, uh, uh, friends who also happen to be writers, uh, is to be what she calls resonators, people who before a book has even been written, when somebody's just getting the kindling and vision of it, it just and it may be quite quite distinct and it may be original and nobody's written anything like it certainly nobody had written anything like either the lord of the rings or the narnia books you know and there's somebody who understands the vision who gets it who resonates with it who feeds back to you something of what your vision is who hears what you're saying and encourages you on and um she has this to say uh it's rather nice she's talking about about how um both Lewis and uh, Tolkien, even when they were quite well known, still struggled with their writing. She says, as these examples from Williams and Lewis illustrate, the writing life can be an emotional roller coaster ride. The excitement of creating is followed by desperate self doubt. Courage and inspiration compete with discouragement and despair. For innovators in general, and for writers in particular, one of the most valuable resources in the midst of these challenges is the presence of resonators. Uh, so what is a resonator? The term describes anyone who acts as a friendly, interested, supportive audience. Resonators fill many roles. They show interest, give feedback, express praise, offer encouragement, contribute practical help and promote the work to others. I suppose Boswell was a resonator for Johnson, wasn't he? Uh, the presence of resonators is one of the most important factors that marks the difference between successful writers and unsuccessful ones. And there's an example. She, one of the great things about uh, Dyer's scholarship is that she sat down and read everybody's letters and diaries. So she gives you, for example, lots of extracts from Warney Lewis's diary, you know, C.S. Lewis's less famous brother, although he was a fine scholar of 18th century France in his own right, or 17th century France. But... Um, so here are some here are some extracts from uh, Warney Lewis's diary in the 1940s on what it was like. Can you imagine this? To hear Tolkien in just that study illustrated there, reading bits of the Lord of the Rings, which they called the New Hobbit, as it was written. They called him Tollers. So here's a little bit. 10th of October 1946. This is Warney Lewis. Tollers continued to read his New Hobbit. So sui generis, so alive with the peculiar charm of his magical writing, that it is indescribable, and merely worth recording pr here for an odd proof of how near he is to real magic. It's amazing appreciation of this thing. Well, it was still a manuscript that perhaps nobody was thinking of publishing. And they did this for one another. I, I, just to move on quickly from, from this. Um, the other great thing, by the way, that she does in this book is she, she summarises every chapter with some very practical suggestions for little writers' groups anywhere of the way they could take these examples and ideas and, and apply them. So um, mostly they wrote their books separately, but just occasionally you get a book with the work of two of the inklings in it. And uh, this one is a particularly important and beautiful and poignant one for me. It's also quite a rare volume. It's looking a bit flaky and I, one day I ought to have it rebound. But um, <coughs> this is a book published by, it's jointly by C.S. Lewis and Charles Williams. It's called The Arthurian Torso. And it was published um, after Williams's death. William by Lewis. Williams, you see, I got it for almost nothing. It was a withdrawn library book. I mean, it's just extraordinary what you can find if you look. Um, anyway, um, 
Lewis had been, Williams had been working on a book called The Figure of Arthur, which is going to be a whole summary of the way the Arthurian story has been told from its earliest sources to the present day. And uh, uh, Williams himself was writing a series of strange but actually very beautiful Arthurian poems about which Lewis and almost nobody else but Lewis was very um, uh, enthusiastic. Lewis regarded Williams as a greater writer than himself, but of course Lewis was famous and Williams wasn't. Um, so I, Tolkien, I think, wrote a little um, cleric you that, uh, about that, which went, um, the sales of Charles Williams leapt up by millions when a reviewer surmised that he was Lewis disguised. Um, anyway, uh, just as an example of the way they were, I want to read you the very last words of the introductory uh, material, as in this book, first Lewis presents the fragment of the book that uh, Williams never completed, and then goes on to write his own, Lewis's own, interpretation of Williams' poems. But he, he gives you a picture of it. He says, the first two chapters of Williams had been read aloud by the author to Professor Tolkien and myself. It may help the reader to imagine the scene, or at least it is to me both great pleasure and great pain to recall. Picture to yourself then an upstairs sitting room with windows looking north into the grove of Magdalen College on a sunshiny Monday morning in vacation at about 10 o'clock. The professor and I, that's talking, the professor and I, both on the Chesterfield, lit our pipes and stretched our legs. Williams, in the armchair opposite to us, threw his cigarette into the grate, took up a pile of the extremely small loose sheets on which he habitually wrote. They came, I think, from a tuppenny pad for memoranda and began as follows. And then Lewis launches you into the book. I love that description of uh, Lewis and Tolkien together on the Chesterfield, lighting their pipes and... Williams, who's a Londoner, he's a bit of a lad, actually. He's a bit of a, well, not a lad, not quite a word, but Williams was not a university-educated man, although he came to lecture in Oxford and had more of the demotic about him, uh, although a man of, uh, he was a man of extraordinary genius. Um, but I like him with his sort of tuppenny notepad and his, his um, you know, his cigarette dangling from his mouth. I mean, he, he could have been a character in a 30s detective novel, uh, as well as being um, a theological and uh, imaginative genius. So, uh, there they all are, and uh, Williams begins reading. And I suppose in a small way, the things I love to do to invite people into my library to pull off a book from the shelves, to read it, to share conversation, is a kind of uh, something of the same thing. That, if you look again at the picture on my, on my wall there that, that James Artemis Owen made, I acquired that because I, I took part in a, in a crowdfunder to get the Bandersnatch book read by another Lewis scholar, Michael Ward. But I think of that picture as a kind of window, really, from my study with its piles of books and its pipes into their study. And uh, although there's a sort of minor gap in time and space, that's nothing. Charles Williams, who's the half writer of this, believed in a thing called coherence, which was the way we, as it were, in the great economy of God and in the body of Christ, we mutually inhabit one another and mutually communicate with one another. And to, to the living and risen Christ, time and space are just modes of his thought. He can link us together anywhere and any time, even as in a strange way you and I are linked now. Good to see you.